I'm ITV's Judge Rinder. I've been a criminal barrister for over a decade. I'm going to be examining cases that have shocked the nation. In today's episode... She had sort of said to me, if I don't want to be with him anymore... I think he knew that he'd lost her, and he threw a glass of water in her face. He muttered something, and then grabbed her with his left arm. I saw a knife. And he stabbed her. I sold my life insurance policy. I sold everything I could get my hands on, all my savings. Anything I could do to keep my children safe. I was horrified, absolutely horrified, to see all the crimes that he was convicted of. This is Judge Rinder's Crime Stories. This is a case of Holly Gazard, a talented 20-year-old hairstylist whose life became a terrifying nightmare when she fell in love with the wrong man. Gloucester is a vibrant historic cathedral city in the southwest of England. In 2013, hairdresser Holly Gazard was planning to move away and to start a new life. Holly was a fun-loving individual. Uh, kept us on our toes, definitely. She was never stood still. When she was growing up, she was a very, very sporty individual and tried all the sports under the sun. She'd do rugby, football, jiu-jitsu, anything that she could do that was more tomboyish, she would. As Holly grew up, she began to blossom into a confident young woman. Like most teenagers, her interests changed and she started to explore new things away from the sports field. As she got a bit older, she turned more girly and like, you know, fashion, hairdressing and interests like that. She had a real flair for colour. You never knew when she came through that front door what her hair was going to look like, you know, whether it was red, whether it was blonde, whether it was shaved, whether, you know, it was parted. She came through with all sorts of hairstyles. As her passion for hair and beauty grew, Holly decided she definitely wanted to become a hairdresser. Left school and got an apprenticeship because she didn't want to go the college route. She wanted to do working. She was very much a hands-on person. She liked speaking to individuals. She liked being with, with people. She was very much a people person. Our friendship first began at Reflections Hairdressers, where we began training together, socialising together outside of work, and it just grew from there, really. Holly enjoyed her work as a hairdresser, but at the same time, she had hopes and aspirations that she would see the world. Dad, uh, I really want to travel. I said, well, yeah, it's a good thing to do. She said, I want to travel on my own. I said, well, hang on a minute. I'm not too keen you travelling on your own, so how about combining your hairdressing with travelling? Cruise ship. She wanted to be somewhere where it was vibrant. She loved the city life. She loved the city life of London. Um, so going on the cruise ships was just something for her to do and to, and to see different places for herself and she got a, a place with Steiner and she was waiting to go to London to train. And at that stage, she got a job in the evenings at a local night bar called Zest. And unfortunately, that, that's where she, she met Maslin. They got to know each other quickly and it wasn't long before their friendship turned into romance. Holly said, can, can I bring a friend home? We said, of course you can. He walked in the door with her, and at that stage, my wife said, her actual words were, oh, no, not him. And the reason why she said that was because my wife works at the local school where he attended, and she had a vague recollection of him being perhaps not the model student at that school. My first impression was, hmm, OK, I'm not liking this, but I don't know you as an individual, so I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. Holly seemed happy, so her parents' initial reservations were put to one side. She got ready to move to London to complete her training for the cruise ship, but she didn't leave Gloucester alone. We took her up there on the Sunday evening and we found out that on the, I think it was the Tuesday, maybe the Wednesday, that he'd followed her up there. They didn't have a job, didn't have anywhere to stay, which we thought was unusual. You know, he's only been with her a week or so. We just thought that he was someone who was perhaps madly in love with her and wanted to, to be with her. Holly spent the next few weeks with Maslin before she was ready to set sail. Everything seemed to be going well for her and she was excited about the adventures she had ahead of her. She finally got her ship, which was the celebration a ship that went round the Bahamas. I was really pr proud of Holly going on the cruise ships. Um, I know it was something she wanted to do, and when she got in, 
We were so delighted for her. We took her to Heathrow, uh, waved goodbye. Uh, we were very upset, obviously, because we weren't going to see her for nine months. After just one week at sea, Holly's family received a surprising phone call. She telephoned us and said, I want to come back. She was a real strong individual, Holly, and whatever she did, she persevered. Unexplainable as to why she would want to come home, because it was her dream to, to work on a cruise ship and travel. On the surface, it seemed that Holly was just homesick. She got a job at a salon there and could be together with Maslin. In May 2013, the gathered family came together for a birthday party in Gloucester. Holly came home with Maslin to join in the celebrations. But for Maslin, the party had already begun. It was a local restaurant, and we arranged the time to, to meet. So we all got there, but he was missing. He turned up, you know, drunk, um, an hour late and quite rude. He was very abusive to everyone in the restaurant, including uh, the people who owned it. He was very intimidating. He was rude to a lot of the um, waitresses and waiters. He would snap his fingers, um, shout, um, and just demand things, really. He was also quite short with Holly. He, his treatment of Holly was horrendous. My partner had to, you know, take him outside to, to calm him down because he was actually upset in Holly. And the way he talked to her was very much like a piece of dirt. The family's feelings towards Maslin turned sour. The way he had behaved was beyond belief. Holly and Maslin returned back to London. However, it wasn't long before his dark side came to prominence once more. They went to the Notting Hill Carnival together and something happened there. I got a phone call from Holly later in the evening and she said, I need someone to come and pick me up. And I said, oh, you know, what, what's happened? And she said that he'd floored her. So my dad went down and got her for the way to London just to move her out and get all her stuff and she wanted to come home. Holly couldn't take any more. She wanted to be home in the comfort of her own family back in Gloucester, but she couldn't shake Maslin off. He got a member of his family to come and collect him and moved him back to Gloucester on the same day so she couldn't even really get a break from him. Chloe's concern for Holly grew. Her sister was barely recognisable. When Holly came back and, and I came round, she, she wasn't herself. I think she'd lost a little bit of weight. Just something wasn't quite right. She wasn't her usual bubbly, bubbly self. She kind of brushed off the incident and said that, oh, she'd had a few too many to drink and she wasn't quite sure what happened. But deep down, you knew that she was pushing that off for a reason. Holly settled into her new job at a salon in Gloucester. When you work together as a group of girls, day in, day out, you tend to share a lot of information quite quickly. There were sort of certain things that she would tell us about how they got together and, and things that had happened during their relationship that made me feel uneasy enough that, I don't know, it was something I felt a bit wary of. Holly was trying to move on with her life, but Maslin's effect on her was holding her back. When she came back, um, she lived with us, but she had a relationship with Maslin, but it was on and off all the time. She had sort of said to me, if I don't want to be with him anymore, I want to get back to my old Holly the way I was. She did say she wasn't happy and she's trying to end the relationship, but it wasn't going well and he wasn't really accepting what she was saying. She started to become quite frustrated, you know. The numbers of calls started to increase. The number of texts started to increase. He was very persistent with his phone calls and his messages. She'd make herself busy so she could tell him that she couldn't see him. In the January, she, she was having difficulties to try and get rid of him and, and say, look, the relationship was over. She wanted to end it once and for all. February the 14th, 2014. She went out with Maslin to deal with him face to face. She told him there and then that she did not want to see him any longer. I think he knew that he'd lost her and he threw a glass of water in her face. She ran out of the, the hotel where they were at and got into a car, but he jumped in at the same time. What are you doing? But a hand on the handbrake stopped her going. Terrified and startled, Holly didn't know what to do. Maslin wouldn't get out of the car. Eventually he did and he stole her bank card, which was in her bag down in the footwell. Maslin made off with her bank card 
and went to immediately draw money out of her account. Holly was so shaken she went home and didn't tell anybody what had happened to her. She went to work the following day as hairdressers do on a Saturday. We picked her up later on that day and she was very, very different. And we asked her what was wrong and she then told us everything about it. So we said, okay, well, we need to call the police. We need to get the police involved in this now because it's gone too far. I sat in with her and she was going through a lot of incidents that no one was aware of. And it was really heartbreaking to hear and quite upsetting that she wouldn't ask for our help or she wouldn't tell us because she wanted to protect us because he was threatening um, our family as well. The police talked to Holly and said, well, have a think about it overnight uh, as to what you want to do. And we'll come back the following day, the Sunday and take a statement. Holly was at that stage a bit reluctant to sign the statement because she said that you have to go to court and she was, she didn't really want to go to court because she didn't want to face him. To everyone's relief, Holly signed the statement and the police began their inquiries. It seemed like the ordeal was finally over and the Gazards breathed a sigh of relief. She went to work on the Tuesday morning, as she normally does. I spoke to her uh, to make sure that she got into work. So when Holly arrived in work on the Tuesday, we all sort of rallied round and Holly then started to tell us um, he'd been texting her. I certainly asked her, I know the other girls did, was she worried, was she frightened? And she had said no. I text her in the day, you know, to say, is everything okay? How's your day going? She said, yeah, it's absolutely fine. I'm just getting on with my clients. Haven't heard from him and feeling fine. We'll see you tomorrow. Finally, he's got the message that she doesn't want to be with him. Asher Maslin had got the message loud and clear, but he was determined he'd have the last word with Holly. So he entered the salon around about 10 to 6, uh, and there were a couple of people in the salon, I think one gentleman and one lady, and there were about four or five um, staff when Asher first walked in, he seemed quite casual. He didn't seem on edge. He spoke to one of the apprentices at the time and said that he wanted to speak to Holly. She was just doing someone's hair. I understand that she said to him, please go, go away. I don't want to talk to you. He muttered something and then grabbed her with his left arm. One of the clients had said, I saw a knife. And he stabbed her. When Holly ended her relationship with Asher, she thought she could finally move on and put everything behind her. She was wrong. For Holly, the nightmare was far from over. No one else was gonna have Holly. If she didn't wanna be with him, then no one else was gonna be with her. I saw two people coming down the drive. I knew at that stage, something had happened to Holly. When Holly ended her relationship with Asher Maslin, she thought she had finally escaped the grip of a terrifying and violent bully. She was wrong. On Tuesday the 18th of February 2014, Asher came for revenge. He knew that the salon at that time of night would be relatively empty. He came in, and as soon as he came in, the manager ran to the back of the salon and phoned the police straight away. And then grabbed her with his left arm. It was a case of if he can't have her, no one else will. Holly had been stabbed. She was badly injured and lying on the floor. Maslin ran off into the night, leaving a scene of devastation in the salon. Panic ensued as Holly's colleagues and clients desperately tried to save her life. There was nothing that could be done to save her. On the Tuesday, the 18th of February 2014, a call came into the police control room stating that a female had been attacked by um, a male. It became quite clear to us within the CID uh, that um, it was a serious incident and that Holly was not in a good way. At 6.51pm, 
Holly was pronounced dead. Maslin had taken her life. Unaware that Holly's day had ended with tragedy, her family were expecting her home as normal that evening. I saw two people coming down the drive, and I don't know why, call it fatherly instinct, but I knew at that stage something had happened to Holly. Holly's father, Nick, had had to face the news alone. Holly's mother, Mandy, was at Sister Chloe's house. I can't explain how I felt because it's, it's unexplainable. How am I gonna tell Chloe and Mandy that Holly's been killed? How am I gonna do that? And the five minutes that it took for the journey from my house to, to Chloe's house, that was running through my head all the time. How, was I, how am I gonna tell, how am I gonna tell? He came into my living room and beckoned me and my mum in. Chloe was in the kitchen and Mandy was in the living room, so I had to try and get Chloe out of the kitchen into the living room. And he was white as a ghost. And what's wrong, what's wrong, because they could see my face. And then I had to tell them that Holly had been killed. I couldn't really understand what he was saying, um, as if it wasn't true, and if maybe if it wasn't Holly and, and they got it wrong. But he said, you know, the police are outside. We've got to go to the hospital. At the hospital that night, the family waited to see Holly. They wouldn't tell us at that stage how she was killed, but they took us to the hospital where we were in a room. And although we were only yards away from Holly at that stage, we weren't allowed to see her because she was a crime scene. The consultant came into the room uh, and he was visibly shaken by what he'd seen. He explained to us that Holly died of multiple stab injuries. The only thing he said that was comforting was that probably after the first one or two that she probably wouldn't have known anything about it, so she wouldn't have suffered. But the family had little time to take all this information in. Their beautiful daughter Holly had been murdered by the man who claimed to love her, and he was still on the run. The family were in potential danger. The police asked, do you know Asher Maslin? And we said, yes. And they said, oh, we think he's done this um, through witnesses from the salon. And we said, well, he's the only person really that would do it and you need to find him. We had to have an armed escort back to our house. We then had to take us out of the village to a safe place. We essentially had a male on the loose with a knife. Um, and so we need to take that threat really seriously. So the family were moved from their address because we didn't know where Asher was. We had to take all the precautions so that the rest of the family were safe. It was almost eight hours after the attack on Holly before the police managed to apprehend Maslin. An arrest was made in the early hours of the 19th of February. 20 to two in the morning, the police called us to say that he'd been caught and that's when we could actually start to relax a little bit from the very fact that he's not coming after us. The police began to interrogate Asher Maslin, but he wasn't giving anything away. He made no comment to any of the questions asked. He showed no remorse. Um, he was quite cold. He was in custody for a few days, repeatedly questioned um, before being charged. We had eyewitness statements, we had the clothing, um, and we'd recovered the knife, so the evidence was overwhelming. It was clear from watching the CCTV and the description from witnesses that of his demeanor when he left their addresses. He was in control the whole time. He'd clearly planned it. That was his way. No one else was gonna have Holly. If she didn't wanna be with him, then no one else was gonna be with her. The investigation into Holly's murder uncovered some disturbing evidence about the day of the attack. Maslin went to pawn a DVD player and used the money to buy the knife. He has been caught on CCTV during that day buying the knife, walking up and down Gloucester for a number of hours with the knife, 
When the CCTV was um, released to us, um, it was obviously premeditated. He went to sell that DVD player for, for five pounds, went over to the road to buy a knife for three pounds, and then was just walking around Gloucester. So he knew what he was doing and he had a plan and, and that's what he was going to do. But it wasn't the first time Asha Mazen's shocking behavior had been seen by the eyes of the law. He was caught on CCTV earlier on in the year with his hands around her throat and he was picked up, but she didn't want to press charges. It was captured on CCTV where Asha approached Holly um, and he had um, put his hand around her neck. Um, Holly didn't make a complaint at that time. Asha was arrested. I think he did that twice to her and, and then the push at Notting Hill Carnival. Another incident where he forced her to get into her car, which he was driving at the time, because he said he was being chased by a couple of people. And in fact, what happened here, he'd gone into a pub where Holly was, he'd beaten two people up. And in fact, when he killed Holly, he was on bail with those offences. And all these things now are starting to add up and, and it gives you a massive picture about what that individual was. He was a perpetrator. He was someone who was controlling. He wanted, to, he wanted her to be subservient to him. And he was very, very manipulative. Maslin's controlling behavior continued when it came to the trial in spring 2014. He refused to admit his guilt. We had a number of court appearances, uh, four in total in Bristol Crown Court. And the reason why we had four was that uh, he, he wouldn't plead at the first two or three. And it wasn't until I think the fourth one that he pleaded uh, because he wanted to have psychiatric assessments. And those reports said that Psychiatrically, there was nothing wrong with him. So eventually, he, he pleaded guilty. During all of those court appearances, we never heard him once say, I'm sorry, or had any remorse. In fact, a lot of his eye contact with some of the other younger members of the family, he was actually mouthing to them. So he had no remorse whatsoever. I think he liked to punish us in what he was doing. He'd look over and smirk and, and smile at us, which would just be infuriating. He wasn't bothered about anything he did or said. Um, he didn't show it anyway. Five months after Holly's murder, Asher Maslin was sentenced on the 16th of July, 2014, at Gloucester Crown Court. A grieving family arriving at Gloucester Crown Court to get justice for Holly. Asher Maslin from Cheltenham has already pleaded guilty to Holly's murder. Today, he would learn his fate. The court was packed for the sentencing. You know, people turned up and they were wearing the, the Holly Gazard uh, wristbands. It has had a major impact, and I think Gloucester have taken Holly to heart. It was a very public murder. Asher Maslin has 24 years to face up to what he's done. We had no expectations, but total faith that the judge would do the right thing by Holly and ensure that the outcome reflected horrendous actions of a cowardly individual. And he just didn't really seem bothered about that at all. He was too bothered about who was there. He was looking around, wasn't really concentrating. He just didn't, didn't care about anything, really. I felt relief because I was like, right, that's it now. He's, he's going down for what he's did. He's doing his time. I hope he never gets out, really. Whatever he is, given would never bring Holly back, so it will never be enough. In 24 years' time, he could apply for parole. We can't apply for parole. You know, he will leave jail and he will start a life again. We won't start our life again. Asher Maslin was a young man intent on getting what he wanted. 20-year-old Holly Gazard paid the ultimate price for simply being in love with the wrong man. I can always hear her voice ticking away in the back of my head, but I just wish I could like hold her one more time and, and give her a proper goodbye. Just everything you have in a best friend I miss about her. I just couldn't understand why he'd want to do that to Holly, to take her life when he didn't need to. He could have just left her be. It was just, it was just horrifying and it still is. This was a truly vicious and violent murder. Holly was attacked in broad daylight 
Her colleagues and members of the public were forced to look on. She was only 20 years of age and at the start of her adult life. The loss devastated her family and everyone who knew her. Over 900 mourners attended her funeral at the cathedral. Her father said she had the entire world at her feet. The only light at the end of this dark tale is that Holly's name lives on through the Holly Gazard Trust run by her father, Nick.